Murder in a Small Town. Before you read this, I just want to say that this is a real thing that happened to me and my cousin. I am not traumatized or anything and I am okay with discussing it if anybody has any questions. It is the beginning of summer, 2018. Me and my cousin are going to my grandpa's ranch for three days because he was going to teach us how to shoot a rifle because he wanted us to go hunting with him. Keep in mind that my grandpa's ranch is three to four hours away from where me and my cousin live. My grandpa was already at the ranch, so me and my cousin left my cousin's house around 7.30. We were about 15 minutes away from the ranch when this started. I was looking out my window, I was sitting in the passenger seat, and I saw a man that looked like he was 50 to 60 years old wearing a white shirt and gray shorts outside his house having a bonfire. Suddenly his wife, I guessed it was his wife, came out the house stomping and screaming at him. He quickly stood up and started yelling back. Me and my cousin were flying down this dirt road so we didn't get to see what happened. As soon as me and my cousin go to the ranch, we closed the gate where the cows come in as my grandpa told us to, and then we went straight to sleep. I woke up at around 3 a.m. and I woke my cousin up because he told me to wake him up if I went anywhere and I wanted to go fishing. I decided that I wanted to take my grandpa's truck, which was a 2007-ish white Dodge Ram. It had a diesel engine and is a beautiful truck. My grandpa's truck was parked around 50 to 70 feet away from the house by the woods. I turned the keys and we headed towards my grandpa's friend's property because he had a river that went through part of his land and it wasn't too far away. There has always been good fishing there too. When me and my cousin were about four minutes into the drive, we heard two loud gunshots. About eight minutes later, I saw that same man from earlier, walking along the dirt road, walking towards a gas station. Me and my cousin got back home from fishing, and went straight back to sleep. We woke up around 9 to 10 a.m., and we got woken up by my grandpa. We sat down and talked for around 20 minutes, and drank coffee. Then someone that has a ranch by my grandpa sent him a post on Facebook. The post had a link to a news article which said that a 56-year-old man had killed his wife with a double-barrel shotgun while his grandson was sleeping in the same house where it happened. I am not even gonna lie, I was terrified after that. What made it even worse was that my grandpa wanted to buy their property since the man's family had put it up for sale. My grandpa then purchased the land a couple months later. But don't worry, we tore down the house where it happened. Nightmare. The hell I've been living in started the moment I first born. My family, me, our dog, my dad, mom, and sometimes my two sisters and two brothers visited us. We lived in an apartment building in the first floor. All of this upcoming things kept happening till I turned 10 years old and we moved to another city. The vibe, the whole vibe at the house was bad. Evil. I could say. We even had to have a priest to come and pray and kind of cleanse our house. It didn't help for a long time though. After, it only got worse. Me and my whole family knew that whatever was going on in that house was unholy. We kept hearing voices like whispering, knocks, scratching, etc. I kept seeing nightmares every night and I still do. Sometimes the electricity went off or the sink turned on by itself. We could always feel this major coldness going trot us. We saw dark figures. Our dog used to bark at nothing and stare for a long time into the darkness. My friends didn't believe me at first, but when they spent even a one night at our house, they totally did believe after that. I'm going to tell a few scary moments from there that I can remember clearly. Remember that these situations were not the only ones and are giving just an example of it. 
So something you should know first is that I used to be a figure skater back then so that took a big part of my daily routines and that our house had security cams just for safety reasons. One pointing from the living room so that the hall and the office room was able to be seen from the camera. I was sitting at living room, being home alone. I was supposed to be there alone for an hour till my practice would start so my dad told me not to take any friend over. I didn't. I was all alone. Suddenly I got a call from my father and he asks me why did you bring a friend over? Your practice starts in an hour then I went quiet for a sec and asked what on earth did he mean? I was alone I repeated for a few times. He explained that from the security camera he could clearly see someone standing in the hallway. I freaked out and at the same time I hear a loud scratching sound from the hallway. I run to our balcony and stayed there till dad made it home and I got to my practice. Two, from the same camera a few months later. I was watching TV with my mom and dad called me. He just wanted to ask how we're doing and said that he misses us. Then he asked his mom in my office doing some work stuff or would I give the phone to my mom and she told dad that no, I'm sitting with our daughter and watching TV. Why? And dad said how it looked like someone was sitting at the office. We checked it out and as you can quest, nobody was. Those times wasn't the only times we saw dark figures from the camera or live either. We and our friends all heard the voices, saw the same figures and felt the same vibes. Thank God we moved away eight years ago. But I still see nightmares and my family do too. I was traumatized and now I'm super paranoid all the time. I just keep feeling that way if those unholy stuff follow us here. I hope not. The baby catcher. His face was as pale as a murderous clown with washed out rain splashed makeup. It was thin like an underfed anorexic psychopath surviving on a diet of saltines and water. His eyes were sunken and dried with a lackluster finish across his pupils. While they lay in set like old oysters on a yellowish bed of old sand with bright red veins. There was no nose to speak of. There was only a bump with two small holes that leaked mucus and breath warm still air whenever his deflated and shriveled mouth was closed. The sight of him was enough to drive anyone mad. That's what I remember of him. That's the image that is seared into my brain like burning on an old arcade screen from hell. I was only about seven years old the first time I saw him. The time I genuinely had regret for what I had done. As for any other bad things I had done as a kid up to that point, I only regret getting caught and getting punished for it. I guess punishment is supposed to teach a kid to regret their actions, but most of the time we regret it if we get in trouble for it. If only I had listened to my parents. Billy would still be alive. Billy's my brother was my brother. He was only 19 months old when that monster took him. We never saw Billy again. As for my parents, they hated me for it. They blamed me for it. They were certain that I had something to do with Billy's disappearance and the hatred that they developed for me created a life with them that was worse than any punishment you could imagine. Worse than anyone could imagine. That's why I'm here, in this prison cell. They really did a job on me and screwed me up well. How it all started was that I had this friend Tommy, the new kid at school. He wasn't the best kid to hang around with. He had a tendency to do bad things. He always dragged me into it, whether I wanted to participate or not. So one day he comes over with this Ouija board. The cardboard Milton Bradley kind. He called it a game. I didn't exactly know what a Ouija board was so if he said it was a game and it looked like a game, I was game to play. The first time was really uneventful. Nothing was really happening and I was disappointed. We kept accusing each other of moving the eyepiece or whatever you call it. Then we started arguing over it. 
My mother heard the commotion and immediately barged into my room trying to settle it all. She took one look at that thing and instantly flew into a range. She screamed at me for playing the game, though she never usually raises her voice at me. This time was different. She ranted and raved about how evil this game was and that it was a doorway to hell. She went on to tell me that if I played this game, I would be opening myself up to the evil spirits. I had never been so mortified in my life. The things she told me about what happens when people play this game scared the hell out of me. I immediately apologized. She took the game and gave it back to my friend and told him to go home. She said she'd be phoning his mother very soon. He just smiled and said, she already knows. After that, he left. My mother then proceeded for another half hour, admonishing me about the dangers of the Ouija board and about how I could invite evil spirits to possess me and take over my body, making me do things that I wouldn't otherwise do. She also whipped out a Bible and read from it various scriptures that admonished believers from resorting to witchcraft. My parents were very devout Christians. A little over devout, you could say. Every Sunday was Sunday school, and every Tuesday evening was a prayer meeting, which lasted to and something beyond midnight. Every Thursday was children's devotion. You get the picture. Oftentimes it seemed like I saw the inside of that church more than school or my own bedroom. So, I spent the next three weeks confined to my room and tasked with doing a report on the Bible, book by book starting from Genesis until however far I could get before my parents decided to relieve me of my penance. I don't remember how far I got or how many reports I wrote, but it was quite a few. My hands were so sore from it all, I could barely do my work at school. After my punishment was over, my parents warned me against hanging around with Tommy. They swore he was the devil himself. I pleaded with them to let me stay friends with him, but they refused. Day after day I tried getting them to let up, but they didn't budge until one day when my mom found out that Tommy was from a single parent home. She started to feel sorry for Tommy. Then one day she asked me to invite Tommy and his mother over for dinner. So I did, and they came. The dinner went well. My parents and Tommy's mom seemed to get along pretty well. I was quite happy about that because I figured now they would let me and Tommy hang out again. After dinner was done, my parents and Tommy's mom were sitting in the living room talking. Then mom brought up the Ouija board incident. Tommy's mom didn't flinch. She was completely unconcerned. This floored my mom. She couldn't believe that Tommy's mom didn't have the same reaction that she did. Tommy's mom explained her side of things. She said it wasn't that bad of a thing. That it was just a game some people play and that all the hooey fooey surrounding it was just a bunch of superstition. My parents strongly disagreed with her and things started to heat up. Then, however, before it all got out of hand, Tommy's mom agreed not to let Tommy bring it over anymore and not to let me play with it if I'm over at Tommy's house. My parents accepted the compromise. I was happy again because I got to hang out with my friend again. Although Tommy was upset about the arrangement regarding the game, he was glad that we could be friends again. All's well that ends well, right? Wrong. I'll tell you why. It didn't just end there. You see, Ever since my mother went on her tirade about that game, and she told me all the neat things that could happen with it, I was intrigued. In fact, I was hooked. Seemingly, all I could think about. I wanted to see that eyepiece thingy move by itself. I wanted to see if any disembodied shadows appeared in the corners of my room. I wanted to know what was so evil about a game made by Milton Bradley. One day I was over at Tommy's. We had just finished playing checkers, go fish, and I think Candyland. We were both bored to tears with those games, and the after-school cartoons were over already. 
I asked Tommy to bring out that Ouija board. He was reluctant at first because he didn't want me to get into trouble like that again, but I insisted. He thought about it for a moment then said, what the heck? Mom's not due back for another hour. Tommy snatched the game down from the top shelf and opened the box sending the box top flying across the room. We started the game. I started getting a little belligerent because, again, there was nothing happening. So I got a little aggressive with the questions I was asking. I started to get snarky and asked questions like, what's it like in hell, or what's the devil like? That did something because all of a sudden, every single toy, book, or trinket on Tommy's shelf started to rattle. Some things actually fell to the floor. When they stopped, Tommy and I looked at each other, speechless. Then we burst into a celebratory yell, yeah. While we were celebrating the fact that we actually made something happen, there was a sudden scream. It was as loud as a lion's roar and sounded like there were ten of them in the room on all sides of us. However, there was nothing there. We were again, silent. Tommy was about to say something, but I stopped him. I was so afraid by then, I didn't want to make another sound or move a single muscle. Then we both felt a presence in the room. It was like nothing we ever experienced before. We were both so scared that we each scooted a little closer to each other. There was a sense of comfort at that point, not much of one but some comfort to say the least. Then we saw a dark shadow start to form in the corner of the room just as I was initially expecting to see. I remember thinking, now I've seen it. I don't want to see it anymore. Tommy pointed it out and when he did, I swiped at him as if to try and grab him. We both screamed. Then it was gone. The room was quiet then. Nothing moved, not a toy, not a book. Tommy's clock had even stopped ticking. After a minute or so, the ominous feeling of dread we felt started to fade. The place felt normal again. Tommy and I agreed never to play that game again. Little did we know that the game would be playing us, playing me. The phone rang. Seemingly out of nowhere. It startled the both of us. Tommy answered it. It was my mom calling for me to come home. He said she sounded scared. Confused, I gathered my things and headed out the door. I only had to walk a couple of blocks to get from Tommy's house, but it was the longest walk in my life, it seemed. Every few houses, I get a strange feeling that I was being watched or that someone was following me. Periodically, I'd turn around to see, but there was never anyone there. Then the feeling would fade. When I got home, mom was there waiting for me. She stood in the doorway of the kitchen holding my baby brother Billy. She looked worried. What's wrong, mom? I asked. Nothing, I just had a bad feeling. I wanted to make sure you were okay, she explained. I'm okay, mom, I replied. That seemed to satisfy her for a bit. Then after a brief pause, she asked, Have you been playing with that devil board? She shot a new question at me with an almost accusatory tone. No, mom. I haven't, I answered. Are you sure? She pressed. Of course, mom. I'm sure. I insisted. Reluctantly, she accepted my answer and then told me to go get cleaned up for dinner. So I did. While in the bathroom, I heard her call out to me. Her voice sounded rattled and afraid. I raced downstairs to see what was the matter. What happened? I asked worried and scared. I found her standing in the middle of the kitchen. She was shaking. When she saw me, she lunged at me with such speed it scared me. I tensed up expecting her to run over me. 
Then I felt her arms wrap around me squeezing so tightly that I could barely breathe. Again, I asked, what was the matter? She said she had another bad feeling but was stronger this time. She questioned me again about the game but I assured her that I was not playing the game. Later that night, I was lying in bed, unable to sleep. There was a tapping sound coming from my closet. Being seven, seven years old, and after having experienced what I and Tommy experienced that day, I was not quite brave enough to investigate. So I laid there in my bed with the covers pulled up to my chin, listening to the sound, hoping it would stop. It went on for about 15 minutes, continuously and unrelenting. Then, I remember hearing breathing. It was faint, but it was there. It was slow and drawn out, and it was wet sounding like someone was drowning in their own fluids. I laid there motionless and silent because if I moved or made a sound, it might get me. That was the logic of a seven-year-old, but it made perfect sense at the time. Then the closet door started to creep open all by itself. It moved slowly, but constantly. The hinges creaked a long drawn-out creak as the door crept open. There were no strings attached to it. There was no wind and no one inside the closet. At least no one that I can see. When the door was open far enough to reveal what was behind it, all I saw were my clothes. Then, just as my eyes fixed themselves on the light and dark shapes among the clothes in the closet, one of the shapes started to move and grow. At least it looked like it was growing. Then after a second, I realized that it was not getting bigger but getting closer. When the shape got close enough to pass through the light that beamed in through my window, I could see its face. It was hideous and horrifying, just as I described in the beginning. I was so terrified by the sight, I was rendered petrified and unable to scream. The thing got close up on me and I thought it was going to eat me or something. It started sniffing around all over me. Then it started sniffing around the room. I couldn't figure out what, but I got the sense that it was looking for something. Then it stood up straight and paused. It was like it recognized something. Like it found what it was looking for. Then it grabbed the doorknob on my bedroom door, swung it open fast, and walked through, leaving the room and slamming my door behind it. My parents heard the door slam and came running. They were sure I was up playing around past my bedtime. They burst into the room and my dad asked why'd you slam my door? At first, I was going to tell them what happened and why the door slammed but then it occurred to me that if I did, they would either not believe me or they'd know I played the game again. So I lied and said that I went to the bathroom and slammed it on accident. Reluctantly, my parents believed me. Mom still thought something was wrong. She got one of those bad feelings again for a moment. I could tell by the way she had her arms crossed and the look on her face was one of hesitation. Eventually, they relented and went back to bed. All right, son, get yourself to bed and go to sleep, he said. And no more creeping around at night. I just went to the bathroom, I argued. I know, but just get to bed, Dad. The next few days were relatively normal. I didn't see that weird shape in the closet. There were no shadows and now eerie feelings. Just regular days. The only thing I remember about those days was that my baby brother Billy was really irritable and cranky. More so than he ever been. My parents thought he may have been sick, so they took him to the doctor. Little Billy came back with a clean bill of health. My mom found it odd that he had been so calm and manageable while at the doctor's. Now that he was home, his discomfort started up again. Other than that bit, everything was fine. Tommy and I talked about that day we played. He said that he saw something move past him in his hallway about the minute after I left. Although, he wasn't able to make out a face or anything. 
He said it seemed to move so fast he barely saw it. Aside from that, he didn't experience anything weird after the game. The next week, I was looking forward to another day hanging out with Tommy when my parents told me I couldn't go because they were going out. Janice the babysitter was coming to watch us. Disappointed, I ran to my room and shut the door. Then the door opened by itself. When she got there I didn't want to come out of my room. Janice was a nice girl. She didn't get on my nerves or complain about me getting on hers. We pretty much got along okay. I was just upset that I couldn't go over to Tommy's. She tried to cheer me up with ice cream. It worked. We sat in the living room with our ice cream and watched a movie. It was an old horror from before I was born. So the acting was kind of weird and cheap. So were the special effects, but it was still okay to watch. Promise you won't tell your parents I let you watch this, okay? She said. I promise. I answered. I like watching you guys, she exclaimed. Then she picked Billy off the couch who was sitting next to her. I really like looking after you, she squealed in that silly baby talk voice people do. I just rolled my eyes in disbelief, oh good grief. Then Billy's sippy cup shot from the coffee table across the room and hit the wall just above the TV Janice and I stopped everything. Billy tore into a crying fit. His voice was so piercing, I had to cover my ears. Janice tried to calm him down, but it was no use. He was not stopping. She started carrying him around the room with gentle balances trying to get him to shut up and then furniture started to move around the room. Janice got so scared that she put Billy down, grabbed her things, and shot straight out the door. Leaving me and Billy by ourselves and leaving the door wide open. So it was up to me to take care of little Billy. Okay, Billy, we gotta get out of here. I told him. Then I took him by the hand and tried leading him out the front door. As we approached the door, it slammed shut and I couldn't get it open. I struggled with it for a minute and then I started hearing the lion's roar. Billy's crying got more intense. I picked him up and looked around to see what was there with us, still trying to calm my little brother down. Shoo. It's gonna be okay. I consoled him. There was no stopping him, though. Okay, we have to get out. I headed for the back door, but it was stuck just the same. Now trapped in the house with whatever was making that noise and moving the furniture around, I ran with Billy upstairs and we locked ourselves in my room. I shoved Billy under the bed to hide him, then I leaned against the door hoping to keep out whatever it was that was after us. My legs started getting tired and I was having trouble holding myself against the door. Finally, my legs gave out and all I could do was sit there on the floor, leaning with my back against the door. Then, there was pounding, like someone was ramming themselves against the door. All I could do was to press my hands down on the floor to apply as much pressure against the door keeping it from opening. I held that position for so long, my shoulders and arms became fatigued, and the burning got to be too much. I had to take a rest. I was tired and out of breath, and my little brother would not stop crying. The world around me became like a dream. I couldn't believe this was happening. Shoo. Billy, you have to be quiet. I said. But it was no use. He was blaring like a siren. There's no reasoning with a two-year-old. When they're in discomfort, they're in discomfort. I didn't know what to do at that point. I remembered a song that my parents taught me, Yes, Jesus loves me. I started singing it. Then the banging stopped and Billy stopped crying. The room was now very quiet. I was able to think now, regain my bearings. I sat there for a time, resting and thinking. 
I pulled Billy from under the bed and held him close. Then I heard my parents come home. They saw the mess downstairs. That all the furniture had been moved around. They called out to me, wondering what had happened. I immediately got up off the floor and took Billy by the hand and ran downstairs. They asked all the obvious questions like, what happened to the furniture and where's Janice? At first I was going to lie to them and tell them that Billy and I were playing and we moved the furniture ourselves. I was going to tell that Janice left after we'd done this because she didn't want to get into trouble for not keeping us in line, but I didn't want Janice getting into trouble for something that was my fault. Not to mention, I figured I could handle getting punished for disobeying mom, I just wanted my parents to keep me safe from whatever it was that moved all the furniture around. So I told them the truth. I told you not to play with that board. Mom screamed. Why are you so hard-headed? Dad interjected. Yeah, I got a tongue lashing of a lifetime and I got punished for it. More Bible reports. This time I had to do the whole Bible. My punishment did not end until I had written a report on every single chapter of the Bible. It got to the point that I came to despise that book. By the time I had finished all the reports, I felt as if that book was written specifically to punish me. When it was all over and done, I was then released from my imprisonment in my room. It was like being free from slavery. It had been six months that passed during my punishment. I was officially banned from hanging around Tommy. This time it didn't bother me as much. Even though the whole idea of playing with the board was mine, I figured it would be best not to even be in the position to be tempted. I would like to tell you that the six months I spent on punishment were uneventful, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Every so often, I would see that thing coming into my room or slinking out of my closet. I dared not tell my parents or they would extend my punishment. Who knows how they'd react if they knew that our house was now being visited by something demonic and it was all thanks to me. So I kept that part from them. I just endured the terror of watching this thing emerge from my closet on an almost nightly basis. I just sucked it up as something I deserved. Things weren't exactly pinwheels and pixie dust for Billy either. Because every time that thing showed up, Billy would go into one of the crying fits. It often took hours to quiet him down. One night, it got really bad. I saw that thing again. This time, something was different. His actions were more aggressive. I laid there in the bed, watching him as usual as he came out of my closet. His breathing was elevated. His motions were jerky and violent. I was never more terrified in my life. He crept over to me in my bed, sniffing and snorting around as he did before. I dared not say anything or move at all. He grunted and growled. He seemed agitated and angry, again like he was looking for something. Then he stood up and shot out of the room. He swung my bedroom door open with such force the door hit the wall and the doorknob left a big hole. There was a feeling I got at that moment. A feeling that leaves you unsettled, like something was bad was about to happen. I immediately thought about Billy. I jumped out of my bed, screaming and calling for my parents. I tried to chase that thing down the hall and ended up at the doorway to Billy room. My parents came out of their room, startled and alarmed by my yells. They found me standing there, staring at an empty crib. Billy was gone. There was no sign of him. My parents called the police, but there was no sign of any break-in. No sign of anything that could give them a clue as to what happened to my little brother. He was just gone. That was the night that my parents learned to hate me. As the years went by, Billy was never found. My parents started blaming me directly for his disappearance. 
From that point, they treated me like shit. There were no more Christmases and more birthdays. There were no happy days. My dad would often tell me that the only reason they kept me around was because it was their God-given duty to raise me since I was their progeny. Some days I was sure my father wanted to kill me or at least wish I were dead. Dinner was somber and cold. My mother would set my plate in front of me, oftentimes, after they were already halfway through their meal. So my food was often cold and likewise dull and bland. After a while, I became numb to it all. It was all life as usual with the people that were tasked with caring for me. That's what our relationships had been reduced to. So that's how the rest of my childhood went. No love, just hate. There was nothing but disdain in either direction. By the time I turned 16, I became rebellious and angry. I started getting into trouble at school and eventually not going to school at all. I found drugs and alcohol to be a comfort. Then there was Tommy. He was a natural rebel since we were kids. We ran the streets looking for trouble and whenever we weren't looking for trouble, trouble still seemed to find us. My parents eventually kicked me out of the house. I had to make my own way. Jobs were hard to keep and I had to make ends meet somehow. So me and Tommy did a lot of things that any decent person wouldn't agree with. We robbed corner stores, stole from grocery stores, and mugged people when the opportunity arose. After a while, things got really tough. I was tired of living hand to mouth. Tired of robbing and running and then subsequently laying low. I got to be too much. I started to resent Tommy for ever having brought that board into my life. I blamed him for what happened to Billy. Tommy tried to reason with me and explain that he had no idea my brother would disappear as a result of a game. His excuses angered me. I grew furious and one night flew into a rage. I killed Tommy that night. I stabbed him in the gut. After that I cut him up into little pieces and scattered those pieces across several parts of town. The police eventually caught up to me. I was sentenced to death as a result. So now I have to sit in here and rot until they kill me.